Aloha. This is Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, we have a show today um, on November the 18th, 2021. This is a weekly discussion show. It's uh, politics for the people. And I'm your show host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. We have um, a topic that is timely and uh, active this week and raising many, many questions. So the political state of affairs featuring Republicans leading in the polls for the 22nd midterms uh, show us they're doing so by a lot. They have the largest lead uh, in, uh, they've ever had in over 40 years. So right now, about 51% of the voters uh, favor supporting Republicans. So let's discuss this state of affairs with our guest panel. And uh, we can um, t talk about what it is that we have in hand right now, how we got here and what uh, to do to suggest to Democrats how to change the trajectory of today's voter preferences for Republicans with what time is remaining in the run up to the 22 midterms. So welcome Jay Fidel and Tim Apicello and uh, Winston Welch for uh, guesting on the show today in this discussion. Um, even, even before their win, as prophesied by these polls, if those are of use anymore. I know we've, we've, those have raised some issues, but um, even before their win, Republicans are ravenous about revenge, for revenge, and threatening to turn out subpoenas, uh, many, many more than, than have been <laughs> turned out so far for uh, Democrats as soon as they are in position. So, the question, it raises the question, are, are the Democrats uh, winning on the accountability issue? And that is a high value and important to our democracy. But the question is, is there a recognition that there might be an unanticipated outcome uh, that contributes to the polarizing and the radicalizing of, of our uh, of our people? Of our potential voters. So only a few years ago, Kevin McCarthy ousted Steve King from the House, while today Representative Gosart presents murderous depictions in media of his colleague, um, sl of slaying his colleague, saying he is a warrior for the past president. And that's what he is all about and his commitment. So what does this tell us about the values that are in play now? Have they possibly changed? Uh, Jay, can you speak to that? What are these values that we as Americans have held and don't seem to be in play now? What is happening? I'm going to let uh, uh, Tim and Winston speak to that, but I, I, uh, I looked at your um, at your title here, and uh, I found that it was a very interesting title for the show. It said GOP lead in polls through, by virtue of, I guess, normalized violence. And honestly, Stephanie, I, I just didn't understand the relationship uh, of those two parts of the title. Okay, uh, I, I guess you want to talk about how the GOP is leading in the polls, and that's good. Uh, but then through normalized violence, is violence a part of their ability so I didn't understand that. So, so I went and looked up normalized violence. And that's what I want to comment on here at the top of the show. Normalized violence is a term of art. I don't know if you intended it to be a term of art, but it is a term of art. It's been studied. <clears throat> and I ran into a lot of articles about what normalized violence is. And I find that normalized violence is actually, according to these articles, articles written some, some time ago, uh, in the immediate term, before Trump, and now. Uh, normalized violence is what is happening in America. And there's a, a several things that I want to mention here, just for you know, the top of the show, and I'll get off. Um, one is that, <clears throat> is that if we have media uh, that is telling us about violence uh, as a matter of trying to get eyeballs all the time, you know, raw meat news stories, reporting on violence all day, whether that's Fox News or MSNBC, 
it's all the same. It makes people think violent. It normalizes violence and it leads to more violence in the community. And according to a number of articles I saw, um, the media is responsible for heightening the amount of violence in our community. Okay, that's one thing. And maybe the GOP likes that. Maybe Trump likes that. The second thing, which is a very interesting article written in 2014 by uh, somebody at the Vera Institute of Justice in New York. I, I know about this organization. It's a very high class organization. And what they said was um, there were two aspects of the normalization of violence. One is um, that, you know, this thing about you, uh, you, you get in with a group uh, that extols violence and you are the object, the victim of violence. And as a result, you're likely, you know, to do violence to others. And so we must make those people accountable. Uh, so to limit the amount of violence. The second part is even more interesting is if you are a victim and you survive, and that means survive physically like you don't die, or if you survive the PTSD aspect of being a victim of violence, then you are more likely. Survival makes you more likely to do violence the next time around. <clears throat> what I'm telling you is the literature seems to suggest the psychological literature, the legal literature seems to suggest we are now in a time where various factors are feeding into not necessarily the educated part of our society, but the lesser educated part of our society to make people more violent. Well, Jay, you go right to the heart of the matter and to um, the definitions that are very useful and hopefully, you know, we that this, this discussion can go on with, with this theme through uh, out what it is we know is happening. And in fact, um, NPR just had a show on about uh, the discourse situation that we have now in politics um, and that it is, it is opening up uh, to violence too. In other words, Jefferson and our founding fathers said, stay with, with the um, themes, the topics, the issues don't go into talk that is violent about the people that you're engaging and showing them to be uh, dehumanized and that leads to violence. But anyway, you've given us a lot of information about the definition of it. And my example of the bringing up the um, GOSART uh, media depiction is an example of, of bringing violence into, into play, into discussion, into discourse, or showing it in, through media where it can go much, much further than ever before. And that is normalizing that topic. Yeah, well, very interesting that in the Vera article I just mentioned, there's a defense mechanism um, that people, you know, that, that people engage in when there is violence. It's called minimalization. And that's exactly what Gosar has done to defend himself, to minimize the violence. Um, and it's very dangerous to allow that. You cannot do that. You must make people accountable. So the House did the right thing, although not the, not the mainstream GOP. Well, um, let's let's go on here to Tim. Um, having had these these statements made, and and Jay's research shared. So, what 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 is what is it meaning to you about what has happened with the ghost art thing and the and and the fact that uh, this, this, yeah yeah I think there's a you could draw correlations to our tribalism in politics, our tribalism that is spilled out from politics into society, and that. That tribalism is the, the primary question always is when it comes to actions and words from the GOP is what would Donald Trump do? And what would Donald Trump approve of? And how can I get a, an invisible pat on the back from Donald Trump and the tribe um, by how outlandish I can act or say, or in this case, uh, create videos that perpetrate uh, violence? And I want to be in the tribe. I want to stick out as a member of the tribe. I want to outdo Donald Trump in some of his outlandishness and, 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 and horrible behavior because that's the way the tribe likes to, to, to roll. And I think that's a big part of where we're at today. 
I agree with Jay completely that um, those studies are valid and there is a correlation and we've been talking about the correlation of violence on TV and TV shows uh, and, and how kids react to it. And, um, you know, that correlation is, you know, it's never been proven because it's, it's, not, it's not a science, it's an art form of trying to determine how, how violence does react or excuse me, the shows about violence react to children's behavior and imitation. And I think they're trying to imitate. And who are they trying to imitate? Donald Trump. Okay, and why, uh, um, to talk about then where that comes from and where that started um, and, what, and what you're talking about is what underlies these increasingly ethnically driven violent statements. And well, well, not just ethnically. Remember in the 2016 campaign, he completely at his rally said, well, if you rough them up, I'll pay for your attorneys to defend you. And when you put a, a perpetrator in the car, don't worry about protecting his head. You know, let, let him hit his head on the top of the, the police squad car. Um, so they take these cues from Donald Trump. Uh, good people on both sides. Uh, another big cue, another dog whistle. Um, and so they learn from their dear leader on what's acceptable. And, 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 and this particular representative, Gozart, um, took it to the next level. I think that uh, you've, you've gone right into the source area that's important to talk about. Uh, you know, where is all of this? You know, the, their lack of accountability, their threats, their intimidations that are, in, are actually, in fact, somehow encouraging uh, voter support and, and, and the, the, the continue the expansion of this support group. So who is this support group that's expanding and growing feeding on this level of, of uh, um, presentation or uh, campaigning or discussing politics. So, you know, um, Winston, Chris Christie says that politics must set, shed the 2020 election issues to go on, but it has actually built up a win trajectory. So, and if the polls are actually informative anymore, which we I have, that's our tool, we have to use them. They're on a run with it. So is Christie's advice wrong about paying attention, uh, trying to get past the 20 election? Is that relevant here with what's happened and what Tim has referred to as already been demonstrated by Trump in the 2016 campaign? Well, we're seeing the cracks now after it's November. So think about a year ago, how our stress levels were nationally we were off the charts you know we just had an election and then all this uh pure un nonsense came after that which came very close to destroying our nation it didn't happen people pulled back you had all of the former um a defense was a defense no they're not, they're not ministers they're uh, department of defense chiefs coming together saying we don't use the military all types of people came out from society and government and everywhere else saying we don't do this nevertheless january 6th happened um, we're still trying to find out what is going on there and we will find out i don't know that it'll make a difference when you were opening the show and you were talking about what can the Democrats do, I think really it's the question as much is what can Americans do? And it's reaching out and reestablishing these fractured um, fake divisions that have been put between us when, in fact, we mostly want the same things. I'd also posit that it's the Republicans that need to have these really important internal um, discussions, discussions inside their family, all the way up to the, the national leadership. And Chris Christie was emblematic of that, as is Liz Cheney. And they're saying, you know what, we got to rein things in here. We are not a party of personality or of a cult. Uh, we're not based around one leader, we're based around a set of principles. And I think if they can get back to that, and I think uh, if they can, as we saw on the show yesterday, uh, you know, Cynthia saying she uh, she might even vote for a ticket with uh, Liz Cheney as president and uh, is it, uh, uh, Adam Kissinger or is that who she was for vice president. In, in any event, uh, those are the those are the important discussions that need to take place there because we need what we're really really looking at is strengthening the values of the Republican Party to get back to its old self and uh, its known self and its true self. 
Winston, I like uh, that you, you're saying that and referring to yesterday's talk. And I also like there when you use the fortification uh, word, because I think that that's something that we, we could talk about here today. Is how, does the, how do the Democrats fortify themselves against this trajectory that, that's you know, speeding along towards taking over the government? But um, what's really important is that also I challenge you on whether we are going after the same, want the same things at this time. Ultimately, and in the biggest picture, of course, I think you're right. But I wanted to ask Jay, if, if you agree that we actually are wanting the same things these, the, the, in, in these parties, or are we in a place where it's very different because we are having different values drive the political discussion? So in, in other words, we have... We have leaders um, and potential leaders who are enabling and enraging and reinforcing anger. And then importantly, including people who have not traditionally been involved on and are been empowered by the political process. They've been ignored and dismissed as uneducated males, rednecks, gun nuts, militia, and whoever else is in that, that mix. And, and, and it looks like that may be a recipe for what the past president has successfully used to not only convince and encourage and develop his base, but grow it. So are we actually operating for the same reasons? Are we going the same place, Jay, as, as a nation, as population of voters? I, I can't help but thinking of Lord of the Flies where you go tribal, you go with a sort of primitive state of nature. I'm not saying that that movie and book, um, you know, were necessarily uh, scientific, um, but, but they do, you know, suggest what is happening now, where you have a, a group of people who, um, who are into raw power and violence, um, who really have no uh, higher ideal to as aspire to, who are un unformed, unformed human beings in a state of nature. And that's really sad. Um, and and I, I certainly agree with Winston's uh, hope in this matter that the Republican Party can see itself clearly. But I want to point out that the Republican Party um, isn't the Republican Party that existed a few years ago. It's different. And the people who run it are different. And I think that the classical Republicans are not there. <clears throat> well, certainly they're not in control. Uh, what we have now is more like Lord of the Flies. So <clears throat> I don't, I'm not optimistic about this. I'm not optimistic that uh, they, can, they can find a better motivation, uh, a better uh, ideology. Uh, I think they're just going to try to win at all costs. That was the discussion yesterday, Stephanie. They just want to win. It doesn't matter, you know, what, what does, nothing else matters. Uh, so so I, I, I guess I would say um, that if you look back at these studies over violence, one thing is clear, is that you have to have accountability. You have to have accountability for the young the pubescent who is watching violence on TV every day. If he wants to act out like that, you have to, you have to punish him. I'm sorry. Um, and the same thing applies to all of humanity. And that means that what's left of the federal government has to act. What's left of the Department of Justice act, has to act. Um, you know, what, what courage um, the executive branch has, either in Biden or the people around him, uh, to actually take steps to hold these people accountable. And now, I mean, I, I don't think there's any issue that if you wait for years to hold someone's feet to the fire, you're not achieving anything. The only way to stop bad conduct is to, is to take action right away. We are not doing that. We are losing ground. So I think the accountability, the accountability alternative is, is losing ground. Uh, where am I going on this? I, I don't think the Republican Party has it to correct itself. It must be corrected by the elements of government that are left, that are still functioning. Well, I wanted to ask, um, uh, Tim, you can comment on, comment on this about the, the Democrats and if they are tone deaf to what the kinds of things are that 
And um, they're certainly, um, in other words, we're talking about what was a 30% group of people that were supporting Trump, okay, from the 2016 election time. And then that kind of stayed there and got up to 40. And now we're looking at a cluster of folks in the majority, 51% of voters who are, are resonating to this, this discourse and this language and being encouraged by these, these values that are not commonly shared at this time across the uh, spectrum of, uh, of voters. I think the rest of the voters in the Democratic Party are b abiding by the established, the, the, the traditional, the, the values that we all have worked out of and the accountability and, and, uh, and working for democracy and abiding by the constitution and being polite and uh, being uh, debaters who uh, stay on the high road and not attack people. So who are these people then and how are the Democrats attending to them? Are they? Are they? Um, who are these people? Well, these are the people, as I said, my first answer are the ones that have, drinking, have drunken the Kool-Aid, the Donald Trump Kool-Aid. And they're taking their, their words and actions to the next level of, of absurdity and, and, and depl de deplorability. And, and they've, they've, they've taken over the party. I agree with Jay 100%. It's not the same party. Um, I'm a Democrat, yet I, I don't subscribe to a lot of the progressive Democrats' values and opinions. Um, the Republicans, the, the, old, the old Republicans that are still calling themselves Republicans, I'm sure they feel the same way. They feel like they're on a roller coaster and they can't get off. Uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see what would happen if Liv Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and Chris Christie or something formed a new party formed an independent party. I know they don't work, but this might be, 2024 might be the year where they just have to clean house, scorch, scorch the house and, and clean it out. Get rid of the, you know, get rid of these, these uh, sycophants to Trump and just clean it out once and for all and start fresh, rebuild. And uh, probably that would happen if they lost horribly because the party split and went up into an independent direction. Well, who would be in this third party, Tim, that would that, that would join? I mean, who? Well, they, it would be a mission of failure. They know they, they would have to know that they're not going to win. Their candidate probably would not win, but it would be a chance to get the party back to where it was, where you know you're you're guided by a sense of uh, a, a, a sense of principles and policies that are working for the people. Is something for, not against, and it's a party not of personality of Trump, it's a party of ideals and, and the conservatism that they've, they've followed that mantra for many, many years. And they've lost that now, they've lost it. They, they, they subscribe to a party of Trump. And you think that those, those would migrate to this third party where they could be the- their... I don't think it's gonna happen. I said it would be very interesting to see it happen. It'd be nice to see it happen. I, I want my old Republican party back. Um, although I'm not a Republican anymore, I would. I long for the days where the the moral majority and the the evangelicals are out of the party. Uh, I, I miss the days where they were based on conservative um, fiscal principles and budget and um, conservative issues. I'm no longer a Republican. Well, you know, uh, Winston uh, Jay mentioned the Lord of the Flies, and you know those those were children. Okay, so the end of the book is you know Captain Adult Who Who comes in, and everybody lines up and salutes again on their coats and buttons. Um, and um, and and of course, um, in the Republican Party, we have the examples of McCarthy, who was completely um, uh, aligned with the traditional values earlier. And um, even McConnell, you know, all of these people were, and they're adults. So we know that they have been in the place that they need to be as uh, Republicans. And uh, that now that they've wandered from that, why, this is the question, where have they gone? Why have they gone? And is it indeed just a matter, Winston, of the win? that they think this is a win and why would they think it's a win? This is not something that wins uh, in the long run. 
the, these, these things come back and bite when you go for normalized violence and you encourage all of these very dark ways of operating. So what, what, are we, what would you recommend that the Democrats start thinking about doing to fortify themselves to get themselves in trajectory to win? I'm, I, I would go back to the Republicans again, and I like Tim's idea of, or of splitting this party into two pieces. It's probably not going to happen. But, you know, we, I just read an article uh, that, that Mitch McConnell was uh, wanted Donald Trump disinvited to the inauguration. And that just came out a couple days ago because he was so concerned that he would have his supporters try and do something that day. Um, that there's no love. Yeah, and there's there's no love lost between these these people. And Mitch McConnell, despite sort of allying himself with this, he's still maybe so, somewhere deep in his soul. If he's got one, which we hope he does, he's he is a principled conservative somewhere in there. And it's not just about raw power; it's about advancing a conservative agenda. And if he can regain that, and then uh, and he's not a come out and say something directly. Uh, to the troops. It's all behind the scenes, it seems to be to me. Um, he's He seems to be a sane individual, and maybe he can start shaping this. It, it's just a turn of the ship, uh, honestly. This is a big ship. It moves uh, very slowly, but we're pulling away. We're not where we were a year ago. A year from now, things will be very different. A year ago, how many Americans, uh, percentage of Americans were going to get a shot? Um, now, what are we at? I mean, even in, 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 in most states, it's, it's, it's just sort of become a, a norm. So as we move farther and farther away from Donald Trump, and hopefully he doesn't regain any national spotlight more than he has, uh, we may gain a sense of, of reality. I mean, as an educator, you know of, of how many um, of the amazing amount of violence that children are exposed to visually on TV, uh, as all Americans are. Uh, we, anytime you turn it on, the kids watch something, I don't know, 10 or 20,000 simulated murders by the time they're older. It's amazing there's not more violence in this country, especially considering we're armed to the teeth. Um, and in many states, you can carry a gun when you go to Walmart on your, on your hip um, or Safeway. Let me, let me add to that, Winston. It's not only the murders they see that uh, that that that, uh, that confuse them. It's the fact that these people get shot, uh, they get maimed, and they survive. And, right. And it, at some level of analysis, these kids who watch this stuff think, "Well, I'm indestructible. That's you take right. me to a hospital. Modern medicine will cure me um, in a mir miraculous way," which and isn't true. They they actually die. These people. They do, but we also have the, their video games, which are insanely violent. I, we're all of an age where we probably have never played one, but if you watch these, uh, they call a FPS or something like that, first-person shooter games. I mean, these this is uh, these kids are they're, they're, they've been target practicing since they could pull the trigger on the video game, um, but th they're not out there doing it. Uh, is my point, and 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 they they could be, and and while this this uh, really egregious thing with uh, uh, with Representative Gosar, um, and and I, I would encourage our our gentle viewer to watch. Alexandra uh, Octavio Cortez's response to that. She says, is this who we are? This is not about me. This is not about him. This is how we conduct ourselves as leaders and representatives in this government and as human beings. It's about basic human dignity. And I think if the Democrats want to press a message, it's that. It's let's go back to basic human decency, dignity, treating each other with respect, starting at the top. I'm disappointed with Kevin McCarthy, I'm disappointed, that's not a, a strong enough word. But basically we're starting. This fellow got censured by the uh, by the House. It's the first time since Charles Rangel in, in a long time and, and not many people have. So they're calling it out, but I don't think the masses are watching that. I don't think they care. Um, they're, they're worried about gas prices, feeding the kids and, um, you know, walking the dog. So, I, I, however, those statements from the top do matter. For anyone that does watch the news, they do matter. These little acts of calling people out and calling them up and saying, this is not normal behavior. What we experienced over the last four year, previous four years was abhorrent. And that is not who we are as a people. That's where we need, that's where the Democrats can do to come back. A really important point, and one of the points here, I mean, that 
we're moving in this direction, in this de despicable discourse, and have been warned against doing this by all history. And anybody that's been co a contributor to the development of the documents that support our democracy, that we're moving in a direction that is got a real bad ending because it does allow those thoughts into words go into action and uh that and we know what that leads to so while we know then i think you made the point that at the at the big picture we all do want the same thing but on the way to resetting for the big picture for today for modern times which has technology and media and everybody knows everything within five minutes of it's happening we're transiting and obviously something is di it's different where a different set of, of values is guiding that transition. And 51% of the population of voters is looking to the Republican presentation as admirable, you know, supportable, something they like and not what the Democrats are doing. So my question again is, I'm back to Jay. What do the Democrats do? What's the recommendation here for fortifying? I like that word you used yesterday for uh, strengthening the the democratic stance, the democratic activity, and of course having more uh, wins and products that people enjoy. What 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 do they do? You keep asking that question, Stephanie. Yeah. I and in many ways, it's unanswerable. <laughs> uh, maybe that's, you know, you're not going to get a good answer. I'm sorry, because there is no good answer. And who are the Democrats anyway? They're not necessarily organized. They're not unified. Um, I told you before that I thought that what's left of the government has to make the GOP uh, accountable. Accountable for January 6th, accountable soon, accountable right now. And that includes the president. It includes the uh, Department of Justice and Merrick Garland. Um, so that, that's some Democrats. The rest of us, all we can do is, um, is vote and encourage others to vote. I met a couple last week who were going to the mainland. They were going to go to battleground states. They were going to try to convince people of color to vote. Um, and that's very noble of them, and I appreciate that. And if there were a lot of Democrats in a lot of states who went to battleground states and made that pitch, that would be something they could do. But, you know, the bottom line, I'm sorry I'm pessimistic, is that there's not that much the Democrats quote. I mean, as an amorphous group of people who are under the same umbrella in some ways and not in other ways, what can they do? Um, well, you know, listen, say, we're in deep kimchi. Yes. I hope you realize that. But yes. Tim has an answer. He's uh, going to give you the answer. I know he is. <laughs> Thank you, Jay, for your, your confidence. Hey, you know, remember when Hillary Clinton said Donald Trump and his basket of deplorables? I was just going to exactly say and, that. And, that and, and remember, she backed down. All yes. she had to do is double down and list all the deplorable things he said and did up to that campaign run and yeah. say, yeah, and if you're following Donald Trump, I meant what I said, I said what I meant. You're a deplorable too. See, I'm that's what something Democrats can't do. They can't I stand behind their words. They can't stand, uh, they falter, they get weak in the knees and they can't stand behind that which they should have stood behind and been resolute about and, and they just fold. And if she would have just never folded and doubled down on it, you know what? She might have won the election because she took it in the polls soon after she apologized for that comment. Um, I think she was spot on and she's been proven right. Donald well, Trump and his followers are a basket of deplorables. You're absolutely right. And I didn't list them among those who've been. Well, that's just name calling. Um, no, you know, if you ask no. Winston, Winston is going to tell you that throwing hate back and forth no, no, doesn't no, solve no. the problem. That's no, not name calling because what you do is, in the case of Go Gosart, you do what they're doing. They're calling out the action and they're putting the leadership on the line saying, you're responsible for this, not just Representative Gosart. You have a role in this, Kevin McCarthy. You have a role in this, RNC. You guys are responsible for this behavior and you're doing nothing. Well, well my, my point is that just throwing rhetoric, rhetoric back and forth doesn't do it. You yes. have to what do you think the Republicans action. do? And they win and they're su successful. 
Oh, they, they do more than just the rhetoric. Folks, that it's already done. The deplorables are now 51% if we want to use that. I, I characterize them as the, you know, gun, the militia, the, the uneducated males. So what I'm saying is, how do we address these people actually have not been, um, they haven't been empowered. For instance, she must be asking you the question. It's the well, no, same I'm, question. <laughs> We're gonna have everybody comment, but the but this group needs guess what education. <laughs> so this this group is now at fifty one percent. They like what they see that's coming out under the the, the guise of uh, you know trying to win. So um, and and but they don't have enough. Uh, guidance and model from the, the Democrats, maybe. What can the Democrats group about? Getting this group up to speed so that they can act like big girls and boys, adults, and become responsible and um, voters. Is that, okay, I'm gonna, I know we, it's time to wrap up and we're, we're gonna be, we're always cut short. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you with, yes, Jay is right, Tim is right, you're right. Uh, and it's all depending on uh, how optimistic or pessimistic we're feeling at the moment. But right now, I'm feeling like when you talk about education, what can we do? It's not Democrats or Republicans. It's all of us. And I take a little bit of hope, a little bit of hope, Jay, in the governor's race of Virginia. Oh. That fellow threaded the needle. He did not mention Donald Trump. And he basically, I don't even think he mentioned Joe Biden. He just said, I'm, I'm running on these positions. And guess what? Those swing voters who did not vote for Donald Trump voted for him. And they were soccer moms. I don't know who they were. Uh, people that wanted a sane conservative party that speaks to their fears, that speaks to them being taken over and everyone's going to be a communist making, you know, lesbian clothes in the re-education camps, melting down their guns, <laughs> uh, you know, whatever fears that have been provoked there. That's that fellow won. The other thing is don't underestimate the power of bringing the casserole to the neighbor, having those discussions or having the harder discussions with your family members who you know, with your friends, who you become estranged with and say, you know what, this was a mess. I just want to forget the whole couple of years. Or if you want to talk about it, this is why these issues are really important to me, because this particular behavior, this speech, this action is reprehensible and and uh, really an anathema to your values as well as my values, because it's an anathema to being a human being. It's not kind, it's not thoughtful, it's un-American. And that's why I am voting in this way. That's why I support this person or this candidate. I don't support everything about them, but this is why and why I want you to understand that as well. And that little butterfly flapping its wings yes, may produce a tornado. Very helpful, very helpful and really closes out the idea well. So Jay, last comment on this round. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, think tech in this program, we try to connect the dots. And every time we connect the dots, uh, we, find, we find something hopeful. Um, but I, don't, I think if you, if you look carefully, if you went back to all our shows, um, including the shows that uh, Tim and I did years ago, you would find little by little, the country is de descending. And uh, this 51% is of great concern. Yeah. And we are we are not doing well, um, yeah. and I and I do not have um, any significant level of optimism that the mm, admirable suggestions that Winston makes will be realized. Uh, I rather think that we're we're going down, man, and uh, I don't know what the future is like, but it's not pretty. Well, Jay, uh, Jay, let's move to Tim's uh, last comment on this All show. Right. Thank you, Stephanie. You know, um, first I'd like to acknowledge uh, the sage words of Winston. He inspires me to be a better uh, politician at, at heart, um, to, to, to dull my blade <laughs> and, be, and be more uh, compassionate towards my fellow Republicans. Um, I probably need to start thinking about that. And in all sincerity, um, yeah, I, I, we're in a battle and we're in a fight. And 
but sometimes you got to remove yourself from that battle and fight and, and look at the, the playground at 20,000 feet up. And I think Winston does that well. Um, but it hasn't worked yet. I'm, we're in a fight and we're going to have to fight hard and we're going to have to call, call them out when they act badly. And that's the GOP, when they act badly and call them out and, and, and set that tone of, of responsibility and ethical behavior in politics. And that starts now. And it's, it actually happened in the House yesterday. So I'm proud of what they did. And um, there should be more of it. These are the dots. We can start connecting these dots, these good dots that Jay said that shows try to trace. So we will we'll do that in our talk. And that's such a good point about uh, the, good, the good things and the standards and the values that we, uh, we adhere to traditionally. Okay, it's time to wrap it for this show this week. And uh, we um, thank you, Jay Fidel. Thank you, Tim Apicello. Thank you, Winston Welsh, for being here on uh, Politics for the People on a pretty uh, crunchy topic. And uh, I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. And we'll see you next week, same day, same time. Mahalo, everyone.